Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm your host, Scott McGilvery, and you are listening to the Real Estate Rebel Podcast. Now, make sure you guys like, subscribe, and follow us wherever you get your podcasts, and go to scottmcgilvery.com to get more real estate and real estate investing information. Now, today's show is going to be crazy relevant because the world has changed and we need to know what that means, especially for real estate investors. Um, we're going to be talking about how the global pandemic has impacted every single one of us um, and what it's doing to the economy and what it means for real estate investors. It's been a time of uncertainty for a lot of people. And we want to talk about how you can turn that uncertainty into opportunity. And I also have a guest today. I have the perfect guest for this subject. So I am bringing in someone who is one of the most well-known, one of the most respected people when it comes to personal finance, Patty Lovett Reed. She used to work on the inside of the financial markets. Now she's on the outside, but she's going to give us some of the tips and secrets we need to know. And she's going to tell us how it relates to real estate and some of the opportunities in real estate. So we're going to talk about today the ways that COVID-19 is going to create a surge of real estate millionaires. I hope that many of you find your path to being part of the financial winners in this opportunity. And we're going to talk about the many different ways that you can take advantage of a disruption in the economy to create a better economy for yourself. I'm also going to tell you about right now what the number one safest bet is for passive real estate investors. First and foremost, let's get to the hot topic. What are the different ways that you can become a real estate millionaire from the COVID-19 pandemic. Patty Lovett Reed, welcome to my podcast. How are you? Great. And thanks for having me, Scott. I'm interested to see where you take this. <laughs> well, I, I you know, you and I have talked a lot about what's going on in the world and we've connected several times through other media outlets and with everything that's going on in the world right now, it's super complicated. People are confused. There's probably nobody alive on the planet today that has experience with something like like a pandemic, mm -hmm. global pandemic. Um, but I, I think it's important for people like yourself who have a tremendous uh, track record in the financial industry, a lot of experience. I mean, you've been on the inside, uh, you've been on the outside. So you kind of have some intimate knowledge into what what we might see from all this and how people can use this as an opportunity to maybe change their financial future in a quite profitable way. And for me personally, I'm, you know, mostly interested in some of your insight on how this will work for real estate investors. And I know you don't call yourself a real estate investor, but I, don't, I believe that you know a lot more about the real estate industry than most people who are in it. Let's get into some CMHC stuff because there's CMHC is always changing the rules. Sometimes it makes it easier for buyers. Sometimes it makes it harder for buyers. Uh, but right now, when I see CMHC making it more difficult to qualify, that to me is a sign that CMHC is predicting more pressure on the housing market. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you. They've also come out with a report that says they see prices dropping over the next 12 months anywhere from 8 to 18 percent. Um, that could provide a great opportunity for some who want to get in. But they're also going to make it harder to get that mortgage CMHC CMHC support um, because a couple of things. One, the credit score, you have to have now six up from 600 when you look at your debt service ratios and your total debt service ratio when you combine them all they're bringing those numbers down 35% and 42% respectively and and you're gonna have to have some liquidity you can't use a line of credit to try to you know ensure that it helps you with your deposit and so in some ways CMHC is saying if you don't have that 20% we're gonna protect you from yourself, and you're just going to have to save up that much more before you get that mortgage. That's definitely going to put pressure on the industry. It'll right. 
See, the challenge is what comes first, the chicken or the egg. If they tighten up the rules, they could be causing the decline in prices themselves. Yeah, and I, and I really think though, Scott, and I agree with you, I understand what you're saying there. Um, but you know, the dream of home ownership for some fear of missing out may have gotten some into the market prematurely. And, and to your point, when you don't have that first time home buyer, you don't have the next home buyer who's moving up to the next home because there's simply not going to be enough people out there to sort of move things along. But I would also argue that right now, we have unprecedented unemployment and that results in no income. And so when that sort of thing happens, you're not having people out there buying homes because right now they're just concerned about, you know, maybe making rent, putting food on the table, figuring out a lot of those jobs that have been lost, they're not coming back. And so they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. And it was those same buyers in the past that were trying to get into the market, maybe a prematurely. You know, this isn't the first time we've seen this happen. In 2008, a lot of people mm -hmm. had, you know, same thing, FOMO, uh, and they tr jumped into the housing market and the rules were pretty loose and prices were going crazy. And then we saw like a total fallout of the housing industry in America. And Certainly. I, I would say like, from what can we learn from that? you know, 12, 13 years ago, what happened 12, 13 years ago in America with housing prices, what can we learn from that and use as a tool for investing today? Because I bought a lot of properties in 2009, 2010, 2011, and I don't regret that at all. That's one of the best purchases I ever made. Well, because, and you already alluded to it earlier, if you're someone that sees a pullback what's perceived by everybody else as a crisis, um, that's when you can potentially move in. I look at it from an investing side of things and that's exactly Warren Buffett. If everybody's getting out, you get in. And so you did exactly that. When I think back to that housing crisis in 2008, 2009, people were walking away from their homes. They owed more than the current property value. But that was then, fast forward, this is now. And when you talk 13 years, that's not uh, you know, a really long time horizon. Even when I tell people to get into the markets, ideally you want to have a five-year time horizon, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to take five years to make money. So if people are getting out of the market, some of them by choice and some of them because of necessity, um, would you go as far? And I know you're really a conservative person, <laughs> and, I, so and I'm a little more aggressive on the investing <laughs> side. But it's almost hard not to, uh, you know, not to get on board with the idea that this is a good, this is a good time to be buying, whether it's, you know, yeah. in the stock market and possibly some companies and and the real estate market as well. Absolutely. Buy low, sell high. I'm not going to argue with you on that. Plus, I will tell you, I am re risk adverse. I haven't even had a variable rate mortgage. I've only ever had fixed mortgages. And trust me, I've done the numbers. I would have been way further ahead when I had a mortgage to go with a variable route. But, but yes, yeah. So buy low, sell high. I, I, I get it. It makes all kinds of sense. You have to be comfortable with that. And when I talk about tolerance for risk, I'm talking about not how much risk you're willing to take on, but you have to look at your family's ability to take on that risk as well. So I think it's the one, two here. Absolutely. Now, I'm also noticing that inventory in the real estate market is a lot lower. It's the lowest yeah. we've seen in like 30, 40, 50 years in some cases. Um, and that's why prices are holding up. They haven't the dropped enough yet. That's the only thing holding prices up. Do you, because I know what I, I'm sort of predicting or watching for, but what do you think is going to happen as we see different waves of the pandemic and different realities? Like once the government uh, funding dries up, mm -hmm. don't you think there's going to be more inventory coming available? Uh, that's a great point. And yes, I do. Uh, I, and, and I do. Because I think that there are people who may be on the cusp of retirement, nearing retirement, and very worried about how they're going to fund their retirement. I, I also see a trend in terms of funding, uh, where some people may stay in their homes longer and the reverse mortgage that is a product out there that has gotten definitely a bad rap 
but I have looked into it a fair amount. And for the right person, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not talking about taking all the equity out of your home. Most people don't. They may take a portion out so they can stay longer and they don't have to pay that back until they decide to sell the home. But I'm going to say something that I know you're going to agree with me. Location and price always sell. They do. People say to me all the time, I can't sell this home. I, I don't know why I'm not selling it. I said, because you've overpriced. You think your property is worth more than someone else does. And so you need to reevaluate that. And location, location, location. Uh, you know, I'm a bit of a real estate junkie. And um, yeah, I, I, you get the right location and it makes all the difference. I'm going to ask you something that's part of what I would consider an advanced strategy for real estate investors, but it okay. really, um, it, it really touches on something that you're a pro on, which is the idea that, okay, I invest in the markets and I invest in real estate not only because it's good and diversified, I do some of, you know, I work with a financial planner, but I also manage some of my own money in the markets. I do a little bit of everything, yeah. but yeah. here is the main reason why I put the bulk of my profits um, into, in with an institution to manage the money in the, in the markets is because I hypothecate the entire thing and put in a line of credit for 80% loan to value of my investments. And I use that as down payments on properties. So for me, if yeah. on average, you know, over the last 10 years, I've probably been getting somewhere between seven and 9% returns on my portfolio, which is with, you know, one of the, yeah. the big banks and, yep. um, and that money, that's great, but I can now borrow against that at a rate of about 3%. So I'm Makes st sense. still getting the spread of profit and I can write off the 3% because I'm using that money as down payments on property and then getting a mortgage for the 80% loan to value. So I know for a lot of people that was just like drinking out of a fire hose, but what are your thoughts <laughs> on that? Like, is this a bridge too far? Oh. Well, probably not for you because you are a risk taker. Do you know how many times I am a financial advisor? I'm a certified financial planner. Um, we have someone that manages our portfolio. My husband and I do it together. It's at arm's length because I don't want to be on air talking about a stock um, that I find as a primary holding in my own portfolio and I, you know, help run it higher or lower, whatever the case is. And so we have it at arm's length. Do you, I can count, no, more times than on both hands the number of times our advisor has told us to do just that. And each time I tell you, I say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not gonna, no, no, we're not doing it. And, and my husband is as conservative as I am. Yeah. So we've had the philosophy, slow and steady has wins the race. We are not in wealth accumulation mode. We're in wealth preservation mode. Um, and that's how we think. And so that's where we're at. And. And I, and this is going to be shocking to people, but I am older than you. Actually, I think my children are your age, but in any event, Not the point chance. I'm, no, the point I'm trying to make is it is absolutely a legitimate strategy and people listening should talk to you or talk to their advisor to find out more about it, but you've got to make sure it's right for you because honestly, it has never been right for me. It's never been right for Jim and we could have written off the interest. There are so many things we could have done. It makes sense. It's just not something we were comfortable with. And, and that's fair. You know, there's certain, there's definitely yeah. different levels and thresholds uh, that yeah. people are willing to take. For me, it does come down to the numbers and probabilities. I don't right. use all of it. I usually only use about 30 to 40% of the line of credit at any given time. Right. And, yep. only gets, and you know, you can cover it off. I know I can cover it off. Right. And I've, I've watched for 10 years. There's now enough room that it's, you know, we've had 10 years of positive energy behind this strategy. Um, it's allowed me to grow exponentially, but I am not under any illusions that it could also depreciate exponentially if, if things went poorly. Um, but, you know, you and I both have, uh, have enough history behind us to, <laughs> to, to, number one, understand the track record, but to be really smart yeah. at this, you have to look at what's been going on long before our time in this business. And I'm always banking on the market and real estate is going to move up and down all the way up. And 
you have to be an optimist to be an entrepreneur. You have to bank on oh, the yeah. that there's going to be waves and uh, ups and downs, but in the long run, it's going to go up. And as long as you leave you know, enough cushion that you can handle a few of the, the dips, which I always make sure there's a cushion there, um, yeah. you, should, you should be aggressive. You should be aggressive with securing your financial future. And you know, even if you do put it in someone else's hands, like a financial advisor, you should understand what's going on. Oh, you need to. Uh, no one should ever abdicate responsibility for their financial life or portfolio uh, to someone else. They need to be involved. That doesn't mean you don't work with someone. It means that you're involved. You know where you stand because, Scott, no one cares more about you or your financial future than you. I mean, you just, that's just the way it is. So you can't abdicate responsibility. That, I mean, what you're saying absolutely makes all kinds of sense. Uh, but then when you get to the point where you think to yourself, okay, um, you know, your history, I agree with you. I've looked at every pullback in the markets. Some are much longer than others, uh, but that's where the opportunities get created. There's, they do, they just do, they do. Um, look at, for example, we've been talking about the stock market. And when I look at what's been driving the markets higher, uh, it's not the bank stocks, which is where I came from and I have money invested. It's technology stocks. They have cash on the books. They know that we've been in isolation. And what are we relying on? Technology. Where are we seeing some of the greatest upside? We've seen it in Zoom. Uh, Fastly, which is another. I mean, these companies have been doing extraordinarily well. Amazon. When I look at the big tech companies, They've hit all-time highs or near all-time highs, and their weighting is exponentially more so now as a result of this pullback than even going into it. And so, yes, opportunities are created. Your key word there was you have a cushion. And as long as you have that cushion, you can be optimistic. And by the way, I'm not an entrepreneur, but I am very optimistic. <laughs> You're optimistic and realistic. And... Uh... <laughs> I think the big thing for me and the people listening is that they they are they are entrepreneurial and they are optimistic yes. and they're you know it's I have often found that it's harder to do well when times are good than it is yeah. to create opportunity when times are bad so it would you know it would be to our fault not to talk to the fact that and I'm going to I'm going to pull something in here that you and I talked about off camera and I wrote it down and I'm like I'm going to circle back with Patty because this is such a brilliant line. You should be quoted for this. Um, what? You said to me, "Crisis shows character." Oh yeah, I did. You yeah. said that line, I wrote it down and I have been using it uh, oh, so many times right. lately because there's been a lot of tragedy, there's been a lot of tough yeah, things going yeah, on yeah. in the market and in the world and we're really seeing the best and the worst of people and i think financially we will see the best and the worst of people as well and right now there's there's a there's a real crisis globally and people are going to be put under financial pressure and maybe that mm -hmm. is you know maybe that is uh, a, a signal that it's time to look at what you're doing and making sure that you are on the right path because this is a crisis and this is, yeah. this is the time to get in to find out what kind of character you have to make the right changes. So coming out of this, you're on the right path. Right. I wouldn't say this is the time to sit down and do nothing. People are like, oh, hit pause and relax. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is when you scramble yeah. and you figure out how you can do something fantastic or extraordinary moving forward. Uh, well, I 100% agree with you. I, I can tell you that I have had pushback on that. So be careful how you use it. No, because there are many people who are struggling just to get through the pandemic itself. And, and I respect that. And I understand that there are a lot of people. But I do think a question that's going to be asked, what did you do during the pandemic? And there are people out there, um, and, and I think it's phenomenal, some of the, the good news stories that we're hearing about. People are raising money. They're giving back to the community. I will share with you, my daughter just recently said, Mom, you like to move all the time. I work out every day. And she is working with a gentleman in the Peterborough area. His name's Guy. Hello. Hello. 
A-I-E-L-L-O. I can put it that way. But here's what he told me. He is walking 42.2 kilometers. He's walking daily till he hits his 100th birthday. And he wants to raise $42,200. That's the equivalent, so to speak, for charity, to give it back to the local hospital. He looks great. He sounds great. He's optimistic. And he's saying, look, we're going to get through this. He's seen a lot in 100 years. And I want to be part of the solution, not the problem. And, you know, you've got to take your hat off. There are people that are going to change lives uh, because they are taking advantage and they have seen their own character going through this. Yeah. I mean, even for me, reevaluating the way I do business in my companies, right. reevaluating how I invest in real estate. Um, and, you know, I think, think one of the greatest things you said there is that people are going to look back. And I always think of it as my kids, you know, my kids are six and eight years old. And when they're 25 and 27 years old, they're going to look up to me and they're going to say, dad, I can hardly remember, but I do remember there was like a pandemic and apparently, well, let's hope like, that. Yeah. yeah, apparently interest rates were down to like 2%. Is that true? And I'll be like, yeah, the interest rates were like 2%. Then they're going to say, what did you do about it? Right, right. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting when you look back because I bought my first home and rates were at 18%. And, you know, I, I thought to myself that, well, that's what it is. And this is our reality right now. And you, you have to, I always say, confront the brutal facts, whatever those facts are, but never lose sight that, that you know what, there's, there, there's going to be a great opportunity in some way. Even still, I've been around for decades, as we've said, I still look for the next opportunity. I still look to think what's going to happen there's going to be something else coming around the corner. And when it does, it's about having the courage to embrace it because I believe our life is like a book and we get to write our own script. And as one chapter ends, no one tells you you're going to go this way or this way. You get to decide because it's your life. It's how you decide to embrace it. And so, you know, if you, if you grab what excites you, believe in lifelong learning, play to your strengths through this, I do think people are going to come out of it so much stronger. And to your point, I'm not going to quote you directly off camera, but when you and I were talking off camera, you said, I'm going to invest in this real estate market. Why wouldn't I? Patty, give me one good reason why I shouldn't. And I didn't have one. I said, I think you should. So let's hope you do well in it. Cause like, I don't want you coming back to me. Well, you know what? I, I, I never give advice to people that I wouldn't take myself. And right. um, to that, I will, I will um, divulge that I have purchased a few buildings that I am closing on in the next couple of weeks. And, you know, they're like 12 unit buildings, 20 unit buildings. Um, and right now, you know, cap rates... Cap rates are sort of somewhere between, let's say, 4% in a place like Toronto, uh, but they mm -hmm. can be as high as 7% in a, in a smaller community, even a little higher. Um, and cap rates typically don't take into consideration the cost of financing. The cost of financing is the huge variable that can make it worthwhile for buying something with a low cap rate. Um, so right now, I mean, the profits on these buildings are extraordinary. But the people selling them are, they're motivated to sell them because they're worried that the renters aren't going to pay their rent. That's why they're, they're starting to sell them. They're like, well, I don't know if my renters are going to pay. I want to sell. I want to get out. So I'm getting some incredible yeah. um, cap rates, number one. And I'm getting sellers who are so motivated that they're even willing to do like a vendor take back. They're even willing to finance part of it. So wow. Uh, not that that's something that I'm going to use in this scenario, but that's another, a whole other topic that we can talk about for people who are struggling to get into the real estate market and saying, well, it's not possible for me because I don't have the money. When you have a market like yeah. this where, where sellers are motivated, there are ways to get private financing or vendor financing in order to be able to acquire the properties. So you got to get creative yeah, at a yeah. time like this, right? I, well, I think it, you do get creative. You do need to think outside of the box. And, 
And you know, some it does it. Not everyone has an entrepreneurial mentality. Um, I would argue that I've always worked in a corporate environment, but I've always been able to carve out my own path because I do think a little bit like an entrepreneur. I I see that there's an opportunity here, so why not try it? I I always say I'm going to go ahead and do something, and then after the fact. I'll beg forgiveness because sorry about that. I didn't know you couldn't do it, but it's already been done. I mean, you got to tread lightly when you do it, but it's yeah. happened more than once for me. Absolutely. You do have to push the, you have to push the boundaries. I always say it's not, yeah. it's not just black and white. There's a huge gray area where you've got to try things that are, you know, slightly outside of your comfort zone or not perfectly mapped out for you because you know, the smartest person doesn't always win because they may be stick too much to the to the rule book. It's the people right. who get creative and create new plays that no one's ever seen before who uh, who get the competitive advantage. So I think the big thing for me is, uh, you know, I and I'd love to keep talking to you. I want to revisit. I want to revisit this because such a it's such a timely conversation. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. We've seen a first wave. Now we're seeing sort of a second wave or or even more of a first wave whatever you want to call it but you know the numbers are they're going up again um this is going to be possibly one of the largest financial disruptions of our lifetime oh no question and no question no, nobody knows exactly what's going to happen but if we look to the past at what's gone on in other financial crises maybe not similar to this one i mean not maybe not the same as this one but similar we know that they have created a surge of millionaires and even billionaires in some cases for the people who figured it out before before it was yeah. Oh yeah, there's no question about it. Um, I would also argue that this time it's very different than it was in 2008 because um, we didn't know, the central banks did not pump money into the economy like they're doing today, the Bank of Canada I'm talking about, but the Federal Reserve, the European Central Union. I mean, money at unprecedented levels is being pumped in. And to your point, um, I think the Canadian economy, we would have been in a far worse situation, even as we stand here now, had the Bank of Canada and, and possibly the government as well, not stepped in and did what they did. Um, I think that changed our trajectory. That's going to help us avert the worst case scenario as things start to open up. And during this period, this little period here, there are definitely people who are capitalizing on it. And what's going to happen with all this money? That's, oh, you know what's going to happen. Was yeah. that a rhetorical question? Well, yeah. So when you, when you look at the deficit, we're talking $260 billion almost, um, it's going to be paid back. It has to be paid back. I mean, it's not going to be paid back now. We know that come July, we get a fiscal financial update from the prime minister. Originally, it was just going to be a picture. But Fitch recently downgraded Canada from our AAA status to AA plus, but with a stable outlook. But that doesn't mean that S&P and Moody's credit rating agencies aren't watching closely. And so the government is going to want to make sure uh, there's a lot more emphasis on this next fiscal update than there was probably in the past. Do you think we're going to see, you know, a little longer term, a lot of inflation from what's going on? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I, I just like to see a little inflation because once we start to get inflation, that's when interest rates will start to go higher. Right. Uh, and right now we're straddling, you know, a comfortable zone. And so I think, I think for now, um, yeah, there's, there's been a lot of money pumped in. It just depends on what we start to spend all that money on. That's fair. That's fair. We could talk about this all day. And I know. All night I know. And almost, almost daily things change. But um, listen, I want to thank you so much thank for you. doing this and for you know, giving us a little bit of insight to the uh, inside edge that you have in this topic. And I want to revisit this in a few months once we know sort of the next stage of where things are and maybe give people an update on what it is they can start doing to take advantage of or, or turn this crisis into an opportunity uh, to change their financial future. So thank you so much, Patty. I really thank appreciate you, it. And we'll talk soon. Thank you. You bet. Thank you.
And you can catch more of Patty on Instagram at Patty underscore love it read. She is a wealth of information. So great. So that uh, that's some pretty cool stuff. Just to recap, big thing we were talking about is interest rates. You know, as a real estate investor, you cannot ignore interest rates right now. You may want to refinance or restructure some of your debt. It might even be worth paying some penalties in order to take advantage of the lower rates that are out there. Lower interest rates means higher profit margins, which is fantastic. Um, there are some new mortgage rules out there. Got to be aware of the new mortgage rules and play to your advantage. You know, you may need to structure things differently or move debt around to help you qualify. So watch for that. Right now, there's low inventory. Um, therefore, prices have remained fairly stable, but we are starting to see the signs of declining prices, which is going to create motivated sellers. That means it's a good time to be a buyer. Listen up, real estate investors. It's time to buy real estate. You got low interest rates and hot, possibly a correction on prices. So that was the information we discussed with Patty. I also at the beginning told you guys that there is a very safe way to passively invest in real estate, and that is REITs. Something you may want to look into is the opportunity to invest in a REIT. That is a real estate investment trust. <laughs> it took me a second there. A real estate investment trust. Uh, they have been performing extremely well. And just like what I do on a personal level, it's cash flowing assets. So the cash flow is still coming in, which means positive returns for investors. Really great. Now, guys, I know that there's a lot of problems going on in the world, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm disregarding what's going on in any way, shape, or form that you can help make the world a better place right now. Absolutely do so. But don't forget to take care of yourself as well. And don't let a crisis go wasted, right? Don't let this be an opportunity wasted. When you look back at 2020, you should be able to say, you know what? Well, there was all this disturbance going on in the market. I found a way, a new path forward uh, that changed my financial trajectory. Whew. This was a pretty serious topic. Uh, we're gonna have to revisit this topic as well and see what happens as things progress and move forward. But the prediction from me, folks, is that there will be some incredibly good buying opportunities for several months to a year. Um, and then we are going to see probably one of the fastest positive runs in the market that we have ever seen because there will be a lot of pent up demand. And as things recover, I think we're going to see a lot of positive energy. And once that starts happening, it's too late to get on board. Time to do something is now. This has been the Real Estate Rebel. I'm your host, Scott McGilvery. Make sure you guys like, subscribe, and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. If you want more information about real estate investing, check me out at scottmcgilvery.com.